Sorry. Okay. All right, so I want to turn back the slide. All right, so you get Sanders' message that um, we could pay for things that people need, like education, if we didn't have this big income disparity, and that part of that is the, the problem is the wealthy aren't taxed enough, or we don't have enough, I guess, redistribution. Um, and so, but to sort of explain, if it needs explaining, why you know the theme of the interview was. Um, you know, socialism isn't necessarily a dirty word. It's because of the historical baggage of totalitarian communism that it is, and you know, a lack of separation in people's minds between communism and, and socialism, or the fear that if we become more socialist, somehow we'll end up um, with communism, and, and we don't want that. And I think probably um, Sanders is in full agreement with, say, Zizek, you know, that uh, nobody really wants to go there. But both insist that you can have socialism without communism or without uh, a st stripping people of their freedoms, and that's possible to do this. And, um, and uh, in fact, Zizek emphasizes this notion of gradual change, right, which we've heard before from other quarters that you you know, you, if you're going to do something, do it gradually. Be willing to change your mind if it doesn't work and things like that. Okay? So in those places, in the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, North Korea, Cuba, and other communist countries, what happened there was that politics foiled um, economic planning. That politics was always more important, as a matter of fact, than the economy um, in those countries. and. You had people jockeying for power, and still jockeying for power, um, with the economy being a secondary concern, and a, a lot of the concern having to do with their own economic position, the, the position of the leadership in those countries, rather than the common people. So they, they did not work for most people. Um, now, leaving that, you know, the Cold War baggage aside, you might say, of the fear of communism, there's another reason why socialism is, is sometimes seen as a dirty word, and that is that the perception is, anyway, that they tend to perform less well economically, okay, um, and that they're more socially stifling or parochial, that they tend to work because they, they're rather homogenous culturally, um, and that the people in these countries want to keep it that way. Um, and so those are, uh, you might call them stereotypes, um, depending on who you talk to and what you read, they're more than stereotypes. Um, there's a program on Netflix that explores this, and it's made by Norwegians. Um, it explores the clash between the Norwegian culture, Norway being a democratic socialist country, a rather homogenous country where they still treat refugees and people who don't look like themselves with some degree of racism, which is depicted on the show. And, and uh, of course, they don't know what to do with the American who comes to them. Has anybody seen Lily Hammer? Okay, so now you know that Johnny is a, um, He's a transplant from New York. He's there because he's a member of the mafia and he has gotten himself into enough trouble that he takes advantage of the witness protection program. And he wants to go to Lillehammer because this was the site of an Olympics that he remem remembers fondly and he thought it was beautiful so he wants to go there. So he goes there but he doesn't want to become a full Norwegian. He does which might not be possible because their mentality is depicted as if you're not born there, you don't really belong there. Uh, but at any rate, he's respectful enough of the culture that he learns the language immediately. One of the first things they depict him doing is learning the language because he knows if he's ever going to succeed in Norway, he's got to speak the language and kind of try to fit in with the people. But it becomes apparent pretty quickly that it's really hard for anybody from America to fit into Norway, and maybe especially somebody who's a, a mobster. 
So I'll show you a little clip of, of this, because this show is excellent for um, depicting this cultural clash that goes beyond economics. Um, let's see if I can get day in Norway after coming to his little house, which was way less of a house than he lived in before.
prøver å bestykke offentlig tjenestemann. Ja, nei, jeg synes det er ikke en ny måte å bygge noe bedre. Du er jo åpen til å kalle polis. Tror du jeg pikker opp den fallen og kalle det polis? You take it easy. All right, maybe you could think differently here. Ja, jeg bare tror ikke. Ok. Maybe we should put this on the account for cultural differences. Cultural differences. Jeg kommer til å føre opp deg på jobb. Søke kurs på fredag. Møte opp deg med en litt mer ydmyk holdning, og så kan vi ta det derfra. Blank sheets, ok? Ok, ok. Blank sheets. Da tar vi med deg denne, så leser du den. Så ses vi på fredag. Thank you. Ha det. Ok, så... Norway is kind of depicted as paternalistic here um, in the sense of, um, you know, you've got a program for everything and you have to go through it to, to get anywhere and kind of put you into a, a slot. So he wants to, he sees Johnny as somebody who's good in the restaurant business, but the jobs around there happen to be, you know, pizza delivery and things like that. And so he kind of sees him fitting in there. And of course, what Johnny decides he's, He's just going to forge ahead any way he can and start this bar anyway. And so he rounds up other people who are kind of a little fed up of living the way that they are and kind of seduces them into cooperating with him, promising them, in one case, a share in the bar that he's going to have. And, and eventually ends up corrupting the bureaucrat there um, uh, in, in an interesting way, getting him to kind of cooperate. So eventually he sort of is able to he, he more or less threatens him or blackmails him with some information that he's gotten. But it, eventually he ends up sort of corrupting everybody around him to where they have more like what the Norwegians would perceive as American values um, that are not as communal and not as, uh, and more about money, more about, um, about taking the shortcut to doing things and stuff like that. So it's a really interesting, program that's well done and it does speak to some aspects of the Norwegian and I guess Scandinavian more generally way of life that people might not really know about. Um, in another scene they have him, his girlfriend lives in, or maybe both of them are moving into some sort of communal, almost communal housing situation where, or it's like co-housing, you know, where people live separately but they live uh, in a way where they're supposed to kind of cooperate with, uh, oh, you know, sound and, you know, what you can do and what you can't do, how you take out your trash when and all of that stuff, which we have to a certain extent here even with our, um, you know, communities with covenants and stuff. But this goes beyond that. And, and you can see him just sort of chafing at all this, but he bears with it and he eventually kind of overcomes all obstacles, it would seem to getting his way and he transplants a little bit of America into into Norway. Um, just a quote from the show, uh, so speaking um, of Frank, this is actually, no, this is not, this is not Johnny, but Frank is another mafioso, but I like this part of it. The guy from Norway says, our philosophy here is that people have nice surroundings, they'll feel nicer inside too and this is in a prison. <laughs> They've got him in temporarily, and it's all you know, quite posh by, by American standards. And he goes, where am I? You know? And they explain to him, no, our philosophy is that we can make you nicer by changing your surroundings, which when you think about it, is, there's, that's, a fairly, that's, a, that's a Marxian type of statement right there. Change your surroundings, change who you are. Um, now, I was going to show this, but I don't have a lot of time, but let's suffice it to say that Bernie Sanders uses the Scandinavian model and support, you saw it a little bit in the Seth Child, Seth Miles, my, excuse me, Myers interview, uh, where, you know, he says, look, if it, if it works in other countries, it could work here, or it's not like some of these things are on track, right? Um, and so, because I, I thought of Norway first because of Lillehammer, I thought I just, and focus in on Norway, which is why you got the, the sheet with the statistics there. Um, Norway is a country that can legitimately, definitely be called a democratic socialist country. It's actually a constitutional monarchy, uh, where they, you know, it's a parliamentary system. Uh, there's a division of powers. There's, you know, 
uh, regular voting takes place. Uh, so it's it's eh, you know somewhat similar to other constitutional monarchies in Europe. The monarchy is kind of less important than it used to be. Uh, they recently disestablished the Lutheran religion. They did that in 2012. Prior to that time, it was the state-sponsored religion. It's still um, heavily subsidized by the state, so by our standards, it's still established. Because we, we consider establishment to be really just about any funding, um, taxpayer money uses for religion. But what you need to understand is that in a country like Norway, and Denmark is Lutheran too, it's very much like this, um, the Lutheran church has a lot of schools and hospitals and things like that that serve a public function. And so basically the tax money goes to support the church's running of schools, hospitals, orphanages, old folks homes, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, you know, um, the American perspective is that's too much intermingling of church and state and it tends to uh, kill religious faith. And that's really largely true. I mean, at least there seems to be a correlation if you look at like the number of people in a place like Norway who believe in God, it's definitely under, I think I've got the statistics in here later on, but maybe not, but it's under 40%. Um, but, but, but they see their church as a social service um, type of thing. I was in Denmark um, years ago and it was already like that. And then people explained to me, you know, this is what the church does. People don't go to church, but they, they supply us with all of these things. So Norway has um, sort of government-mediated capitalist economy in which the government sort of stands between the workers and the owners in their negotiations and helps to set wages, uh, what people will pay and their benefits. Okay? So, it, so the workers don't have the classic unions like we do, which basically lobby the government and try to force owners to you know, to pony up more benefits or wages based on threatening to strike. Um, they do have unions, but, but they're different. Their strategy is different because the government is involved, okay? They have a large social welfare system. They have universal health care. Um, so it's not like uh, the Affordable Care Act. It's a single-payer system. Uh, they have free education, not only for people in Norway, but apparently, I looked this up, if you want to get a free education, I think you could go there and get it as an American. Although, you'd have to factor in the high cost of living there. But it still might be, especially if you're getting a graduate degree, it still might be a pretty good deal if you could learn Norwegian. Um, the, the, of course, they have... Uh, rather large unemployment benefits, but their unemployment is really pretty low. It's like under 3% right now. Um, although, if you looked at like underemployment, you might be able to make a case that a lot of Norwegians are sort of underemployed, or not employed full time, or not employed necessarily at the, to their full potential. Um, and of course, they have a strong um, retirement or social security system. Also, a little bit of socialism here in that the state owns some industries that it considers to be particularly crucial. Norway is actually a country that um, sells an awful lot of oil. Right now, it's probably hurting a bit because of that. Um, but it's done Norway well over time. I think outside of the Middle East, it might be the number one um, oil producer. Um, so there's state ownership of oil. Um, and utilities like electric and water, trash, things like that. Um, uh, there's banking is not private and telecommunications isn't private. So if you look at your list of prices there, I think one of them has to do with somewhere there's what your telephone bill costs. Stuff that's directly owned by the state is probably going to cost a little less. Let's see. Well, we got the internet here. So it's, it costs 37.35 there, an average of 43.39 here. Okay. All right, so you get the picture, right? Um, it's a state where people have quite a bit of economic security, right? Um, and where the state is more heavily involved in some of the areas of life that in America people have um, still considered to be uh, 
private, you might say. Right? Okay. Now, as far as taxes go, uh, this comes from the actual Norwegian government statement uh, about what the taxes are for. They say taxes comprise the main income for the public sector in Norway. Well, that's no brainer. That that happens everywhere. The taxes that we pay on pay are spent on public services such as health care, education, transport and communications, in addition to covering joint expenses, taxes are designed to contribute to greater equality between individuals. Okay, so that's a stated goal um, in their taxation uh, philosophy. Okay. Um, this is a graph of the top marginal income tax rate in various countries, but we'll look at Norway here and the United States. So there's not, a, it, it's not as big a difference as you would think. The top marginal income tax rate is the most that people can pay on their income, to, you know, depending on how much they make. So in the United States, the top rate that you can possibly pay on income is 46.3%, and, and in Norway it's 39%. And this is from this, the Tax Foundation. And so is this one. Okay, so, but when you look at progressivity, this is interesting. And uh, I, think, I think it somewhat explains, to a certain extent, the goal of equality here um, for Norway. Um, and what this means is that in the United States, to hit the top marginal income tax rate, you have to make 8.5 times the amount of money of the average person. Okay. In Norway, to hit the top tax rate of 39%, you only have to hit one and a half, approximately, times the income of the average person. So the income tax rate in Norway is much less progressive than it is in the United States. And that's something that I think contributes to the equality in Norway, weirdly enough, right? Because everybody pays a lot, both people at the lower end as well as people at the upper end. It also explains another thing which we'll talk about, which is that there's still quite a bit of disparity in countries like Norway, okay? But in a way, Norway treats people more equally because everybody is paying quite a bit. Um, and it takes a lot of money to run this type of country effectively, which they do. I mean, their economy is pretty good. It's thriving, okay? Um, but it's a, it's, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a pretty different way of life, okay? And I wonder if Americans were faced with well, if you make, let's say, what's the median income here? Probably about 42000 So let's say if you make $65,000 a year, you'll pay 40% of that in federal income tax. I wonder, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it, people would have to face this reality because this is you know, Norway's experience of, of what it takes to get there. And it might be a very good choice to make, okay, based upon the life that you get as a result, but it's a big, big step. Okay. Um, this is from Bloomberg.com, and it's, it's about uh, the wealth gap in the Nordic region. It says, for the first time ever, and this was back in 2011, the wealth gap grew more in the Nordic region and Germany than anywhere else in the traditionally low inequality countries. During the first decade of the 21st century, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said in a report in 2011, one reason is that the wages of the top 10% have been rising faster than the pay for the middle class, according to the report. Um, and they talk about this professor, Thomas Piketty, um, in his book, Capital in the 21st Century. Um, he examined centuries of data on countries including the U.S., Sweden, France, and U.K. for his book to show that returns on capital in excess of economic growth lead to widening disparities in wealth. According to the OECD, the Nordic countries boast some of the highest levels of income equality among industrialized nations. Den Denmark and Norway rank in the top four of an OECD study of 34 nations. Okay, so. 
income equality is something that they have more of there. Okay. There are, I mean, it, don't you have something here? This is what was frustrating about looking at this is that here's a report that says they have more inequality. So I suppose it's, it's the way that you churn your numbers. Um, these are the st statistics on religion. I did keep them in there. So 43% of women and 33% of men say they believe in God in Norway. And just based on anecdotal evidence, a lot of that is, in, in my view, is just because the, the uh, Lutheran church is so heavily involved in the state. People think of their church differently there. Otherwise, I don't know. Okay. Um, this is from the Tax Foundation, just kind of interesting. It says Scandinavian incomes, income taxes raise a lot of revenue because they're actually rather flat. In other words, they tax most people at these high rates, not just high income taxpayers. The top marginal tax rate of 60% in Denmark, which differs from, yeah, that's different from, than from Norway by quite a bit, it's a lot higher, um, applies to all income over 1.2 times the average income in Denmark. From the American perspective, this means that all income over $60,000 1.2 times the average income of about 50,000 would be taxed at 60% in Denmark. Okay. So 40% in, in Norway. 60% so that's, that's a lot. Sweden and Norway have similarly flat income taxes, income tax systems. Sweden's top marginal tax rate of 56.9% applies to all income over 1.5 times the average income in Sweden. Norway's top marginal tax rate of 39% applies to all income over 1.6 times the average Norwegian income. Right. Okay, compare this to the United States. The top marginal tax rate of 46% kicks in at 8.5 times the average U.S. income, around $400,000. So the American taxation system is more progressive than the taxation system in Norway and Denmark. And that does contradict what Bernie Sanders is saying, but that's what I found, okay? But I think that what, as I said, what creates the income equality is precisely that everybody is taxed rather heavily, and that money then gets transferred to the state to provide services and things that people don't have to pay for directly. That's what produces the equality, okay? So, um, where does that lead a country like Norway? Well, um, we're running out of time, but maybe I'll have to come back to this briefly on Monday. But Norway is very famous for being a prosperous country with this kind of democratic socialism, okay? So, um, it's, it has been at the number one spot in the UN Human Development Index for uh, 12 years in a row. Um, now, there are, <coughs> Lots of measures by which you measure quality of life, but in life expectancy, level of education of the average person, income and standard of living, Norway ranks really high. Okay. Um, it earns high marks in all these areas. Okay. So um, now in other areas, not so much, and that's what I'm not going to have time to talk about today, but I'll get back to it on that. Where am I going next? Oh, I turned it. I know. Okay. Well, I hope I didn't lose the rest of my presentation or I'll have to recreate it, but anyway. I'll make sure that I give you the other side because that's important. So um, I'll do that before I get started on Monday. And if it, did anybody come in late and need one of these?
Just me here from now on because it seems like I need I need like focus right towards right before I yeah, come in here. Yeah, if I'm in here, a distraction, so. you can always let me know if you need me to come there. Okay, yeah, that way you can. I understand. Yeah. 